morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay, that was terrible. Let's try this again. Good morning, everyone. All right. Oh, God is good. And all the time. All right, let's do that one more time. If you're not familiar with this, you just repeat, right? God is good. And all the time. Amen. You know, I, uh, I am so blessed to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It was a, uh, it's, I mean, a, what a day. I mean, I feel like, and I, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but I feel like summer's getting ready to come, and I'm, I'm very excited about that fact. You know, I, uh, I, I'm getting the correct amount of vitamin D now. I don't know if y'all get, like, towards the end of winter, things just start getting a little blue, right? It's not, uh, it's just North Idaho, it's valleys, and it's dreary, and, but man, that sun comes out, and it is beautiful. So, uh, I also, I love being in the house of the Lord, and it's always uh, fun watching the fellowship that happens after worship. And, and just that moment where we all get to walk around and shake each other's hands and just chat and mingle. Uh, if you like that, if you're like, I want more of that interaction, we serve breakfast at 9 o'clock. Come hang out. No pressure. You don't actually have to eat if you're, you know, not so breakfastly inclined. But uh, just come and hang out. Come and fellowship. We have a men's and women's group. It meets on Tuesday nights. Come and fellowship. Uh, we, uh, part of the desire of our heart is to fellowship together. In the Greek, the word is koinonia. And it's this community that we have together. And I just love that. And I love seeing you all here this morning. So we're going to get back into the study of John this morning. So last week, Corey took us through chapter 16. Now, who remembers why we're reading through the chapter of John? Why did John write the book? John wrote the book, and he said this very clearly. We've read it almost every week. John 20, 31. But these are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So where we last left Jesus and his disciples, they were participating in the Last Supper. They were gathered in the upper room. And last week we heard the last part of what is called the Upper Room Discourse. That's your $5 word for the day. The Upper Room Discourse. And that's where they're talking and Jesus is giving a final teaching to his disciples. And in chapter 17, we're going to have something new happen. There at the Last Supper, Jesus finishes teaching. He says, take courage, I have conquered the world. And it's funny because I can hear Corey say, and now let's pray. <laughs> because that's what chapter 17 is. It is the Lord's Prayer. No, it's not that Lord's Prayer. It is the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer of our Lord as he pours out his heart. See, up to this point, we have seen Jesus acting in a few different roles. But the Jews were looking for a Messiah. Now, what that Messiah was, was three things. A warrior, a priest, and a king. Now, we have seen Jesus acting in these roles, but it wasn't necessarily the roles that the Jews were looking for. So, in, uh, at the very beginning, they believed that Jesus that their Messiah should have been acting as a messianic warrior of freedom, right? The last time I, I talked with you all, I shared about the Maccabees and how just before the Roman Empire, there was a dynasty called the Seleucids. And uh, there was a Jewish revolt where they rose up under the Maccabees and they overthrew this dynasty and there was a brutal struggle, lots of war. Uh, it's a very interesting read. It reads about like the movie 300, if you've ever seen that. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not a pleasant read for the people of Israel during that time. And so the Jews were almost expecting a return of the Maccabeans. They were expecting these, these military leaders that would rise up and fight against. David overthrowing the Philistines in the Old Testament with just a, a sling and a stone or, or as king multiple times, right? Or Samson even further back where he slew the Philistines. They were expecting this miraculous warrior from God to overthrow their physical enemies. What they're missing is that their enemy is not of flesh and blood. 
We struggle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers in the heavenly places. And so what they were looking for was not what Jesus was going to bring. Not a physical warrior who would rise up and overthrow the Romans. He was a spiritual warrior who would rise up and overthrow sin, Satan, death, and darkness. And we see this. This is not man defeating man. In Isaiah 11, 4. I've got it in my notes. So in a lot... <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay, so Isaiah 11.4, it says, He will treat the poor fairly and make right decisions for the downtrodden of the earth. Now, that sounds like Jesus. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and will order the wicked to be executed. The wicked. I don't. It actually says wicked in my notes, too. So Apparently, Jesus played cricket. But I think what it's supposed to say is he orders the wicked to be executed. And we see that, not here, but we see that at the end of days when Jesus returns in Revelation chapter 19. And behold, I see him coming from the clouds on a white horse. The returning, conquering warrior. But Jesus didn't come to conquer the world. He came to conquer sin, death, and darkness. And so they thought that when it said he will rule over Jerusalem, that, they, they thought that meant the Romans. They're gone. No more Romans. We're good to go. So they expected this great military leader to rise up, but they missed the curse of the snake in the garden. See, that's the very beginning of where this messianic warrior comes from. Given to the line of David all the way down, but God the Father said unto the snake, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The very first prophecy in the Bible pointing to Jesus. That was the warrior that came, but not the warrior they expected. We then have the Messiah, the King of Kings. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6 says, I am the Lord, promise that a new time will certainly come when I will raise up for them a righteous branch, a descendant of David. He will rule over them with wisdom and understanding and will do what is just and right in the land. Under his rule, Judah will enjoy safety and Israel will live in security. This is the name he will go by. The Lord has provided us with justice. We see it there. We see it again in 33, 15, and 16. He will do what is right and just. That's what it meant to be a king. What was the downfall of the Israelite kings? Unrighteousness and injustice. Time and time again, they would turn their back from God. And they would focus on themselves, on pleasure, on earthly things. And Jesus regularly defied the rules of the Pharisees. But they were not just. They were not righteous. Is it not better to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus regularly defied those rules and those leaders because he was leading with what was right and what was just. He was trying to show that his kingdom, as him as king cared more about what is right and what is just than about some words that were written to try and prevent people from coming close to the possibility of sinning. See, the Pharisees back in the day, they had a, a commandment. The commandment was, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, for it is the day of the Lord. And so they decided, well, we want to make sure we honor that day. We better figure out what that means. And so then they made about 35 laws about what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. And, and so now, instead of sinning was not honoring the Sabbath, it was, if you break any of these laws, that's sinning. And then it was like, well, we don't want to get close to that sin, so we're going to make another set of rules that we're not going to call these sins. They're more guidelines. That's how a lot of people in North Idaho view speed limits. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just guidelines, right? But Jesus said, I care about the words of my father, not the words of man. And am I not honoring my father by doing what he has commanded me to do? 
Now, the people recognized Jesus as king. We talked about this the last time. When he rode in the triumphal entry on a donkey, right, they cried out in John 12, verse 13, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Right? They, they knew who he was. They acknowledged. They're like, okay, so Jesus, he may not be that warrior. Maybe this is him starting to be that warrior. They were thinking maybe this is the moment. Right? Hosanna, if you remember, literally means save us, save us, save us. Matthew 21, 12 through 13, immediately after that, what does Jesus do? He cleanses the temple. See, the triumphal entry happens... And he, as king, does what is within his authority. He walks into the temple, flips the tables, kicks out the money changers, and is king of righteousness and justice. He says, this practice, this is not right, this is not just, this is not of the Lord. Remove it from my father's house. He is king over all Israel. But there's one problem. See, Jesus has three jobs is to be warrior king and priest but jesus was of the line of david not of the line of aaron not of the line of levi he could not be a levitical priest he couldn't have served in the temple but luckily our god is bigger than a little bit of bloodline worry amen So today we're going to start, before we jump into John, with a little history about how Jesus is the priest. See, in the book of Genesis, we meet an interesting character for about two verses. There's a ton of information given, he said sarcastically. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine... Now he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth. Worthy of praise is the Most High God who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. So it's the first tithe we see in the Bible. But who is Melchizedek? What an interesting character that that Abram, the man who God promised, would bow down before him. That he would tithe unto him. Well, let's look at Melchizedek. King of Salem literally translates to prince of peace. Right? Salem is peace. Uh, There's also some belief that Salem would have been uh, an early Jerusalem. And that this would have been the king of an early Jerusalem before it was known as Jerusalem. Melchizedek, the name itself literally translates to king of righteousness. Now, what is Jesus? He is the king of justice and righteousness, right? We call him our prince of peace. There are some similarities here. What did Melchizedek bring out? He brought out bread and wine to offer as a sacrifice. And last but not least, who did he worship? He worshiped God Most High, El Elyon. He was the priest of God Most High. Right? He recognized that this God of Abram was above every other God. And that is who he was a priest of. And so Abram gave him a tenth. Now in Psalms 110... We get this idea for how can a king be a priest, right? Because God made the kings from the line of David after the line of Saul was cut off. And so we see these kings continue on, and and ultimately we end with Jesus, but they're not of the line of Aaron. They're not of the Levitical priesthood, the line of Levi. So how do we have kings and priests? Well, Psalms 110, it says, David was from Judah... Oh, excuse me, it says the Davidic king exercised a non-Levitical priestly role. 
The king superintended Judah's rituals and had authority over the Levites. He sometimes led in formal worship. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15 and 11 through 15, where he actually uh, instructed the Levites to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He joined the procession, offered sacrifices. He wore an ephod. Everybody say ephod. That's, that's the garment that the priests would wear that had the stones in it. Right? And he blessed the people. At the dedication of the temple, Solomon led that ceremony, offering sacrifices and praying on behalf of the people. We routinely see these kings acting as priests, acting over the priests. And they get this authority, and Jesus ultimately gets his authority, as is laid out in Hebrews. Now, I know we're talking about John, but I'm trying to un help you understand that there, Jesus had three roles. It was his warrior and king, and, and we see those roles very clearly in the story of John. But seeing Jesus as high priest isn't as clear. And that's one of the greatest arguments used against him by the Jewish people is that he was not of the line of Aaron. He couldn't be a high priest. But according to Hebrews 7, 1 through 10, it says, Now this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning to his, from defeating the kings and blessed him. To him also Abraham apportioned a tithe of everything, his name first means king of righteousness, then king of Salem, that is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, he has neither beginning of days nor end of life, but is like the son of God and he remains a priest for all time. But see how great he must be if Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tithe of his plunder. See, there is no genealogy given in Genesis, a book that is filled with genealogy, right? Beginning to end, there is, and so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. We trace lineages throughout the Bible of everybody that's important. And who doesn't have a lineage? This first priest of the Most High God? But it's an important fact that the writer of Hebrews mentions. He is without father, without mother. See, there's, there's no bloodline for him to be connected to. Blessings, covenants, and curses are passed through bloodlines. But Melchizedek has no bloodline attached. His priesthood is not a spiritual priesthood. Or excuse me, not a physical priesthood. It is a spiritual priesthood. If you're noticing a pattern here, Jesus was not coming to conquer physical people. He was coming to conquer spiritual death and darkness. In the same way, Melchizedek was not here to be a physical priest, but a spiritual one. It also says he has neither beginning of days nor end of life. He is a priest for all time. It's eternal. But notice, neither in Genesis nor here is he named the high priest. And that is because he is a priest of the Most High God. But Jesus Christ is the high priest. Amen. It continues in verse 5. And those of the sons of Levi who receive the priestly office have authorization according to the law to collect a tithe from the people. That is, from their fellow countrymen, although they too are descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who does not share their ancestry, collected a tithe from Abraham and blessed the one who possessed the promise. Now, without dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior. And in one case, tithes are received by mortal men, while in the other, by him who is affirmed to be alive. And it could be said that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid a tithe through Abraham, for he was still in his ancestor Abraham's loins when Melchizedek met him. That's a really interesting way of saying that Levi was still not yet born. But because his recent sire, his, his great, great, great grandfather, uh, gave a tithe to Melchizedek, that that bloodline continues and Levi would have given a tithe as well. My favorite thing in this entire passage is 
Now, without dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior. And in one case, tithes are received by mortal men, while in the other, by him who is affirmed to be alive. I want you to think about that. So obviously, we have in, uh, superior blesses inferior. All right, that makes perfect sense. Clear as crystal. But the next part is so important. Tithes in the Levitical priesthood were offered to the priests. Right? They were offered to God, but that was how the priests ate and lived, was through the tithes that were given. But every single one of them died. The Levitical priesthood hasn't had a high priest. The last high priest died. As every man has died. Except a couple. Because it says, and in one case, tithes are received by mortal men, while in the other, by him who is affirmed to be alive. The writer of Hebrews is talking not only about Melchizedek, who is said to be without beginning and without end, but also Jesus Christ, who is alive today. See, Jesus is not a priest of the line of Aaron, of the line of Levi. Jesus is a priest of the line of Melchizedek. This is a line that predates Israel as a nation. It has no beginning or no end. It predates Levi and Aaron's priesthood. And it has a greater authority than Aaron's and Levi's priesthood. They are inferior to the line of Melchizedek. And Jesus is superior. There are many who believe that Melchizedek may have been Jesus himself walking at the time. Now, that's not something we can confirm with solidity because we get two verses about him. But there are so many similarities, and he is such an image of the coming Christ that we can say with certainty, as the writer of Hebrews does in 8 verses 1 and 3. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary, and the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. For every high priest is appointed to both offer gifts and sacrifices, so this one too had to have something to offer. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear that Jesus Christ is our high priest, not of the line of Aaron or Levi, but according to the superior order of Melchizedek, that the forefather Abraham sacrificed to. Now you may all say, this is well and good. That was interesting. Thank you for, for sharing that that you learned over the week. What does this have to do with John? <laughs> what this has to do with John is we are about to see Jesus for the first time clearly operating as high priest. See, chapter 17, like I said, is called the Lord's Prayer. It is the prayer that Jesus ends that dinner with. And we just read, what are the jobs of the high priest? The high priest is a minister in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle to the Lord, what does it mean to minister? It means to attend to the needs of someone. We see this time and time again in both the tabernacle and the temple that the priests of Aaron would minister to the Lord. There were times where David would minister to the Lord. Now, this isn't to say that God has needs that he you know, can't meet on his own. This is clearly saying that we are fulfilling our needs to worship God. We are ministering to the Lord. We are giving him worship and praise and adoration. The second is a mediator, right? The high priest would go between, they would bridge the gap between man and God. We see this time and time again. I'm going to be honest. I thank the Lord that the temple curtain was ripped and that I have a personal relationship with Jesus because I don't know that I would want to be a high priest in, in the time of the tabernacle. To know that you had to be so ritually clean and pure that you, there was a strong possibility that you were going to die when you entered into the court of the Lord. In that most holy place, they would tie stuff around your ankles so that, yeah, if they had to pull you out, they didn't want too many to go with you, right? I thank the Lord that he has mercy and grace and that, that I am able to step 
into his presence that I am made righteous by the mediator, Jesus Christ. That I don't have to worry about dying because God is so holy. I have been made holy by Christ. Not a thing I can do about it. And the last thing he does is he, is, uh, he offers sacrifices. Right? To offer gifts and sacrifices for atonement. It really clearly says that every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So this one too had to have something to offer. And so we start in John. We're going to break down this Lord's Prayer into three big parts. And the first one is Jesus prays for himself slash the Father. Right? This is Jesus operating as a minister before the Father. He says, if you want to turn in your Bibles, this is John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he looked upward to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son so that he may glorify you, just as you have given him authority over all humanity, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had before the world was created. I just love that. Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I had with you before the world was created. What is Jesus doing here? He's praying for the glory of God through the Son. I glorify your Son so that I may glorify you. I glorified you on earth by doing your work. What did Jesus do? He glorified the Father in all that he did. You know, it kind of mimics the Lord's Prayer a little bit. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, I mean, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer starts out the same way, by ministering to the Lord. Jesus here ministers to the Lord. He also confirms that he is both God and King. The Father has given the Son all authority. The Son was with the Father when? In the beginning, before creation. I was glorified with you then. Glorify me now, that I may glorify you. See, this is one of those really interesting principles in the Bible, the relationship between the Father and the Son, and soon to see the Holy Spirit. He confirms that he is the warrior that will defeat sin and death. He says it very clearly. Just as you have given him authority over all humanity, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. The end of death. The end of sin and darkness, eternal life given to all those who the Father gave unto the Son. Jesus ministers to the Father in his first act as high priest. But he continues by mediating. He starts to pray for his disciples. In John 17, 6 through 9, it says, I have revealed your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They belong to you, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they understand that everything you have given me comes from you. Because I have given them the words that you have given me. They accepted them and really understand that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. What I, I, this is really important. Jesus did not say they understand all of the words that I have given them. They understand that the words I have given them come from you, and they believe that you sent me. That's important right there. I am praying on behalf of them. I'm not praying on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you have given me because they belong to you. Jesus is praying for his close followers, his disciples, the ones who are at his side every day. Jesus is mediating with the Father. See, he's making it clear that just because they're his followers, they are actually followers of the Father. 
They were given by the Father. They understand that Jesus' authority comes from the Father, and they see that through the words of the Father that Jesus has delivered to them. And again, this does not mean that they understand all of Jesus' words. Uh, we're doing a, a Bible study in men's group we just started called Doctrine. It's all about Jesus. That's the title of the book. And I love, uh, there was a moment in the teaching last week where we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. And uh, the speaker said, you don't have to understand all of the doctrine of the Trinity. You just have to believe it. <laughs> and I thank the Lord that I don't have to understand all of creation. I don't have to understand every single word that was spoken. I just have to believe it. God will reveal. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't be able to give a full account of our faith at every moment. Like God calls us to be ready in season and out of season to give account for what we believe. But does that mean I understand the greatest mysteries of the universe? Nope. And if you do, please come and talk to me after service because I've got some questions. See, Jesus didn't require understanding. He required belief. And now he is mediating. He is praying to the Father on behalf of his specific followers. Verse 10, he continues, everything I have belongs to you. He's speaking to the Father here. And everything you have belongs to me, and I have been glorified by them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you. See, the actions of the disciples routinely glorified the Son. They followed. They were disciples. If you remember a few months ago, I talked about what it means to be a disciple, to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. They would literally walk these long, dusty roads between towns. And as a disciple, if there were many of you, which, I mean, we know there were how many disciples? We had 12, 12 guys. Could you imagine walk, hiking in the mountains of North Idaho and the person who's leading is teaching you? And there's 12 of you trying to follow and listen and get close. And man, that's difficult. That would be hard. And so the saying was, may you be caked in the dust of your rabbi because they wanted to follow so closely that they heard every word that he said. They wanted to mirror image what their rabbi was. And Jesus said, they have done that. They have heard my words. They have obeyed them. They have followed all that you have commanded them they are glorified the Son through their actions. And then Jesus says something really interesting, which if you guys have remembered as we've been going through the book of John, Jesus has alluded to this fact multiple times with his disciples, but he's never said it so, so plainly. Could you imagine sitting at Passover dinner and Pastor Corey gets up here and says, just so you know, I'm going to pray. And, and as he's praying, he's, he says, and God, I'm coming to you but they're going to remain in the world. I would have some questions. I would have some concerns. Corey, what do you know that I don't? But Jesus is making it very clear. His time is ending. He continues, he says, Holy Father, keep them safe in your name that you have given me so that they may be one just as we are one. When I was with them, I kept them safe and watched over them in your name that you have given me. Not one of them was lost except the one destined for destruction so that the scripture could be fulfilled. What does it mean? So in the NIV, it actually translates when it says safe in your name. Holy Father, keep them safe in your name. The Greek is en tu onomati su. And it means safe in your name. The NIV translated it as by the power of your name. And there is some truth to that, that it is God's name that protects us. But it's more than just by the power of his name he protects us. As we read this entire passage, Jesus is speaking of a unity of believers, that they are united in God. They are called in his name. Right? I have... Uh, Keep them safe in your name that you have given me so they may be one, just as we are one. Jesus was calling on God to protect his disciples as followers of Jehovah, as followers of Yahweh, so that they would remain together. 
They would remain one just as he and the Father are one. I kept them safe and watched over them in your name that you have given me. Right? This is Jesus speaking again of the words. He's saying that these followers have been faithful. They have heard the things that you have said time and time again, and they have walked in them. Not one has wandered away. Not one has left from being a disciple of Christ. He's praying, Father, keep them loyal to you. Keep them safe in your name. And then there's those words, so that they may be one as we are one. We are called to be safe in the name of God the Father, to be followers and Christians, so that there is a purpose here. The purpose is so that we may be one as the Father is one. This morning, I love watching the fellowship that happens because we are a family. We are called to be one as brothers and sisters in Christ, just as God the Father is one. See, faithfulness to the Father leads somewhere. It leads to unity. Not one was lost. They left their faith. He continues in verse 13, but now I am coming to you and I am saying these things in the world so they may experience my joy completed in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Jesus is making two very bold points here. We are to be separated from the world. We are not of the world. See, it's the word of God is what separates us from the world. Jesus said that very clearly. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. There is a separation between the words of Jesus and the actions of his followers and the words of the world and the actions of the world. This is not a physical separation. Again, we see this difference between the physical and the spiritual. Jesus is, he says it very clearly at the end. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them safe from the evil one. We are supposed to be in the world, not of the world. We have the words of Christ inside of us. And Jesus is crying out to the Father, protect my disciples because they're going out into the world. They're in the world. I'm leaving. And they need your protection. You protected me, protect them. How often as Christians do we mistake this message of not of the world and we withdraw we do our own thing. I'm not going to go talk to them. They're, they're not Christians. I'm not going there. They're not Christian. We are called to be separate from the world spiritually. But physically, we are called to the world. And our safety comes from God the Father. Jesus cried out that you keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to the world. We must not withdraw from the world, but we must be lights in the darkness. If we're salt, Jesus is praying, stay salty. If we're light, Jesus is praying that we would be safe from the enemy that would try to dim the light. Not that we would withdraw and just be a group of lights together and then there's a whole bunch of darkness out there. We are called to go out and light the darkness. If we're a city on a hill, Jesus is praying that we would have firm walls to protect us from attack. But we are still called to be on a hill and not in a canyon in Antarctica where no one can ever see us. See, he isn't praying that we would diminish from the world, but that we would be protected from attack. That we would go forward with boldness and be the words of God the Father that has been spoken through the Son to us. In verse 17, he continues, set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. And I set myself apart on their behalf, so that they too may be truly set apart. 
See, the word is what separates. It's not distance. It's not physicality. It's the word of God that separates, that divides heart from mind and spirit. It's the word of God that convicts inside of us when we're doing something we shouldn't. Or when we're not doing something that God is calling us to do. And Jesus is our example. We follow in the footsteps of our master. Jesus ends this passage with what I think is one of the most encouraging things I have ever read. Did you know that Jesus prayed for you? God, the Son incarnate on earth, knew you were going to be here. And he prayed for you. He says in verse 20, I am not praying only on their behalf, speaking of his disciples, but also on the behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. How many of you is that this morning? I believe in Jesus Christ because of the testimony of his disciples. That they will all be one. Well, that's a little convicting. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Faithfulness leads somewhere. Faithfulness leads to unity. And unity leads to what? That the world will believe that you sent me. Unity leads to our mission. It leads to what God has called us to do. The glory you gave to me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one so that the world will know that you sent me and you have loved them just as you have loved me. Oh, wow. Wow. I have never heard more oneness and unity talk. Now, this isn't to say that we accept heresy. This isn't to say that, that, there, that there are many paths that lead to heaven. right? Jesus was very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Wide is the road and broad are the gates that lead to hell, but narrow is the road that leads to heaven. Jesus is very clear. But what he's also clear about is his prayer for his church, for us today, was not a prayer for victory. It was not a prayer for prosperity. It was a prayer for unity. And that's convicting. I know I definitely have struggled in my life with ought with my brother. I have struggled with ought with those around me that were called of the family of faith that, that said, I am a follower of Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. I can affirm the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed that we spoke last week as we took communion. I believe every single word of that. And it's like, yeah, and I'm mad at you. And Jesus says, no, nope. You are called to be united because that is your testimony that you are united in each other, that you are both one as the Father and I are one. We care for each other's needs. We do the things that are required to serve one another. We glorify each other. We build each other up. We don't tear each other down. See, this relationship between Jesus and God the Father is the example. The Father is in Jesus. We see this over and over. He has been given the words of God. He has been given power, physical power to manifest and to make miracles happen. He has been given authority. He commands demons to flee, and they do. Jesus has given us the words of God, power and authority. Amen? Greater will they do. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. We see it again in Mark 16 and Luke 9, 1. Jesus has given us the authority as followers, as disciples of Christ. But we are called into that authority as the relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. It requires unity. Jesus is also in the Father. 
we see this time and time again. Jesus cries out, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus submits to the will of the Father. God, the Father, may your name be glorified. See, our unity is how we are to be known by the world. The Pharisees, no unity. Uh, if you didn't know anything about the Pharisees during the time of Jesus, there were two great sects of Judaism amongst the Pharisees, and they were divided. You had the, the followers of the son of Hillel, one of the great rabbis, and the followers of the son of Shammai, another one of the great rabbis, and they, they butted heads. Right, one was more legalistic and one was more, more gracious God, right? We would think about that in these terms today where you would maybe have somebody that was a little bit more Calvinist and somebody that was a little bit more Arminian. You know, somebody maybe uh, you know, very, very staunchly, these are the words and we have to follow them exactly. And we have other, well, God has some grace. We still, <laughs> there's, there's some wiggle room here. But the Pharisees had no unity. Not only were there, and that's just within the Pharisees, there were also the Zealots, there were the Sadducees, there were all of these other groups that believed that they were right in how they worshipped God, and that because of all of the rules that they had created, everyone else was wrong. How many of you know that God doesn't care about a bunch of rules that man created? Our God cares about us abiding in the Father by the words that were given to us through his son. See, we are united in those words of Christ. In verse 24, he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they can see my glory that you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Again, Jesus is saying, I'm God. I was there before the creation of the world. Hi. Hi. Righteous Father, even if the world does not know you, I know you. And these men know that you sent me. I made known your name to them, and I will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and that I may be in them. See, Jesus ends his prayer with his eyes towards where he's going. Again, he's, he's saying, I'm leaving. I wish I could take them with me so they could see the glory that you're going to glorify me with. I want my followers to be with me. But I'm leaving them in the world. And I have made your name known to them and I will continue to make it known so that the love you love me with may be within them. Just as Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus, Jesus desires for that unity between his followers and himself. The love of the Father in Jesus and in us is important. That we may be in Jesus. That we have that love and that faithfulness. What is Jesus calling us to? A life of faithfulness. See, as the, the worship team comes back up to, to close, Jesus prays for three specific things for his followers in this prayer. He ends after this prayer as uh, a sacrificial lamb. We're going to read more about chapter 18 tomorrow. But in that role of high priest, right, we had their job was to minister, to mediate, and to sacrifice. Well, we heard ministry. We saw mediation. And Jesus immediately in chapter 18 will go and be betrayed and arrested. He will be sacrificed. Both as the high priest, he offers the sacrifice, he offers himself up, but also as the sacrifice, the perfect and unblemished lamb. So how do we today fulfill the prayer of our high priest? What did Jesus call us to? Number one, he says, a call to remain in the Lord. This is faithfulness. It doesn't require understanding, just obedience. See, the Father has given us to the Son, and we are his. Just as a bride is faithful to her husband, we are called to be faithful to the word. 
I saw a, a YouTube short uh, earlier this week that I thought was really poignant. And it was what the world views versus what we view as followers of Christ. And so it was um, a man on both sides, and, and uh, he said uh, to uh, himself playing a woman, he goes, uh, where were you? Oh, I was, I was going on a date. Who are you going on a date with? I'm not running back and forth every time. Uh, <laughs> he goes, who are, you, who are you going on a date with? And, and she goes, well, I was going you know, on a date with somebody else. And, and he said, well, but not me? She's, no, 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 somebody else. It was just, uh, you know, it's my boyfriend. He's like, boyfriend? We're getting divorced. We're done. Like, and he, he was a lot angrier than I am. And then it said, what Jesus does is we walk away and, and Jesus says, where were you? And we say, I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. I was on a date with somebody else. And Jesus says, I love you. I forgive you. Come home. And then she goes out again and comes back. And Jesus says, where were you? I looked for you, and I could not find you. And she says, I'm so sorry. Jesus says, I love you. Come home. All I want is for you to be at my side. All I want is faithfulness. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Come home. And it was a process. Probably happened three or four more times, and it would tell, show like a, a time in between, you know, where at first it was happening every, every day, and then every week, then once a month, maybe once a year. And finally, it was at the end of her life, and she said, Jesus, I love you. I'll be with you always. See, Jesus requires us to be faithful. He calls us to stay firm in the Lord, to not wander. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. So here's my heart. Seal it for your courts above. We are not to be of the world, but being in the world, we will be tempted. We will struggle with the things of this world. But Jesus calls us to faithfulness. And he prayed that God the Father would hold us in his name. In the palm of his hand. But faithfulness cries out for holiness. If you were here many years ago now, uh, there was a sermon series that Pastor Corey preached called A Cut Above. Holiness literally means to be set apart. That's what we are called to be as followers of Christ, is set apart. We are the light. We are the city on a hill. We are the salt of the earth. We are not like everything else. We have to be different. And this was Jesus' prayer for his people, that we would be holy. This process, here's your other $5 word of the day. It's called sanctification. It's being made righteous. And living out a righteous life. God works on our hearts. And step by step we walk towards him. We belonged to the world. But now we belong to the son. The father chose us. Narrow is the path. It's a journey. See, that's what I find interesting. Jesus didn't say narrow is the plate that you stand on. Jesus said narrow is the path. You will be walking. You will be moving one way or another towards or away from the life that Christ has called you to. But you can rest assured, if your way is broad, you're probably going the wrong way. I ask for holiness that comes from the faithfulness to God. See, nowadays, things change. Things that were acceptable five years ago are now forbidden. Things that were forbidden five years ago are now acceptable. But you know what doesn't change? The word of God. Right? The word of the God stands forever. Everything that he has said, all of the words that Jesus has given to us, that were given to him by the Father, those don't change. 
That's how we know that that path is narrow, because the world says, no, you can do whatever you want. There are many ways that lead to heaven. There are many ways that lead to salvation. And Jesus said, no, there's one. It's me. And all I call you to is faithfulness. And that's going to bring on some holiness. And if you are my follower, that's going to bring on some unity. See, we are united through the sun. I think about the TV show, The Chosen. We've been watching that with our youth group recently, and it's a really fantastic tool to see practically what lives would have been like during the time of Christ. And one of the things that they embellish a little bit uh, is, is the story of Matthew, the tax collector. And in the show, he's shown as mildly, maybe autistic, um, and he's definitely hated and reviled by all of the other disciples of Christ. Right? Because he was a tax collector. He was someone that had cheated them. He was someone that they, that had rejected all of the teachings. He had done wrong to his family, his family being the Jews. See, Matthew didn't have unity. And what I love watching is as these young men are following along with Jesus, they may start fighting. The moment Jesus shows up, no more fighting. Right? Because they are so focused on the words of their master. See, that's the unity that Jesus calls us to as we walk along this road to life. We are faithful to God the Father. We begin to live a holy life called according to Jesus and what following the words that he has given us. And we can walk in unity, doing those things together. Unity is so important to Jesus that he mentions it seven times in this passage. And more than that, the followers of Jesus would continue to write about the unity of the church multiple times throughout the New Testament. I picked out just the highlights here. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, the writer says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree together, to end your divisions, and to be united by the same mind and purpose. What is our purpose? Jesus is our purpose. Absolutely. Go unto all the nations, teaching them all I have commanded you baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are commissioned to go. We have a purpose. We have a unity in that. We can totally let everything else go and just do that, and we are obeying the will of our Master. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, I therefore, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness. See, there's one of the problems. It's a little difficult sometimes to live with humility and gentleness. With patience, here's my favorite line, putting up with one another in love. How many of you got somebody in your life that like, God, this word was for me, I need to put up with them in love. Making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It doesn't just say putting up with one another, right? I have family members that I put up with. It says putting up with one another in love. See, God is what? God is love. We have the relationship of the love between the Father and the Son and the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit. We see love time and time again bringing unity. Colossians 3.14, to all of these virtues add love, which is the perfect bond. Philippians 2, 1 through 2, says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort provided by love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any affection or mercy, complete my joy and be of the same mind, having the same love, being united in Spirit and having one purpose. See, we continually see humility and love. I'll leave you with this thought. There is a uh, fantastic TV show for children called Bluey. And some of the younger people are chuckling because they've probably watched more of it than their kids have. But, <laughs> but there is an episode where the two kids are talking 
And one of them makes a statement, grannies can't dance. And the other kid says, yes, they can. And the other kid says, no, they can't. And it starts a fight to where they won't even talk to each other. And the mom comes to the child that said, grannies can't dance, and said, you have, you have a choice. She said, well, I want to be right. I said, okay, well, then you can't play together. And she said, no, 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 I want to be right and I want to play together. And mom said, no, you can be right or you can play. What's more important? See, Jesus here is saying that there are things that matter. We have to have that fellowship, that faithfulness with God. We have to have holiness that Christ calls us to, to walk along with him. That we are called according to his word to do the things he has called us to do. And everything else, we can either play together or we can be right. We can't be both. Christ on earth, God incarnate, prayed for you, not for prosperity, not for wealth, for the building up of your kingdom. He prayed not for the expansion. He prayed not for healing. He prayed not for defense of, of uh, you know, our, our lives and our lands and our holdings. He prayed simply that we may be one in the Father that we follow the Son of God, that we may be covered in the dust of our rabbi. That's what binds us together. By fulfilling the high priestly prayer of Christ for faithfulness, holiness, and unity, see, we, the church, will spread his word to the world. He is our warrior, our king, and our high priest, and it's time we start living like it. Amen? Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you have done. God, I thank you that you have come, that you have overcome sin, death, and darkness, that there was nothing that you could not overcome. God, I thank you that you are our king, that you rule and reign. And God, I thank you that you will again rule and reign on this earth.